Hey, everybody. Today, I am so excited. I have an absolutely wonderful guest to share with you, Miss Rosalie De La Ferre, and she is absolutely fantastic. Rosalie is passionate about inspiring people to turn to the healing gifts of medicinal plants and nature connection. She's the author of the best-selling books, Alchemy of Herbs, Transforming Everyday Ingredients into Foods and Remedies that Heal, as well as the co-author of Wild Remedies, How to Forage Healing Foods and Craft Your Own Herbal Medicine. I love both of these books. They're fantastic resources, beautifully done with just a wealth of knowledge and information for you. And Rosalie is also a registered herbalist with the American Herbalist Guild and was an herbal clinician for six years before deciding dedicating her offerings to herbal education. In addition to writing books, she teaches many online herbal courses about herbalism and medicine making. And it's an absolute honor to have her on the show today. Hello. Hey, how's it going? Good. Nice Good. to see you, Mel. Nice to see you and like talk to you almost face to face because almost, yeah, almost. <laughs> I've seen you for many, many years. So nice to mm -hmm. actually get to have a conversation with you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. I've been enjoying listening to your podcast. I just listened to Jim's and started listening to Shana's. And nice. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I have a lot of fun interviewing other great herbalists. So I know you do the same, but it's uh, it's a good time. Yeah. So I'm super excited to have you here. Hey, everybody. I am super excited right now to first share my views so you can see who I get to talk to. We could both see each other. And I am having the great honor of having Miss Rosalie De La Ferre on the show today. Super exciting because I've been listening to and learning from and admiring and being inspired by you for a long time going on 10 years now, I'd say. So wow. yeah, through Learning Herbs and Herb Mentor, and I have your books and I love them. Rosalie, as I said in the intro, she's the author of The Alchemy of Herbs, which is a really fantastic book because a lot of the herbs in here are things you cook with and that are in your medicine cabinet. And she gives you a, a good dose of history and um, obviously the medicinal properties and some fantastic creative and fun recipes. So making medicine good for your taste buds is one of the things I like to say. It's kind of fun. And she's also the author of Wild Remedies, How to Forage Healing Foods and Craft Your Own Herbal Medicine, which who doesn't love doing that? At least any herbalist, <laughs> that's for sure. So um, it's really, really great to have you here. So first of all, thank you for taking the time to chat with me. And oh, it's such a pleasure. Yeah. After, you know, watching you and reading from you for so many years, I I would love to hear like how you got into herbalism. Like what are your first memories of when the plants were like, hey, I'm calling to you and you've mm -hmm. got some some good work to do. I'd love to hear that story. Yeah, that's an interesting way to put it because I, I don't usually start that far back. Um, <laughs> but I do remember the plants calling me. Um, I remember I lived in Southern Utah and I was on a, like a guided hike with my dad and we were in Snow Canyon. And so it's like all just to set the scene, it's lots of like red rocks and slick, slick rocks. And um, it's hard to, for me to think of what the plants might have been there, but I do remember one because the guide has told us um, that this was Mormon tea and he told us how you could make tea from it. He showed us how you could break off a little bit of it and just like kind of suck and chew on it. Uh, and I, it was like mind blown. I just couldn't believe it. And I was so compelled by it. I just thought it was so amazing. And the thing is like for, I mean, I must've been, I don't know, maybe 10 or so. It doesn't taste good to a 10 year old. You know, I remember it being <laughs> astringent. I didn't know that word, but I have that specific memory of it being very astringent and kind of bitter. And I was hooked. Like, I just thought that was the coolest thing. And I remember like, telling you know my friends and stuff we'd see Mormon tea out there and I would like you know proudly show them oh this plant is used for tea um so that was like I remember that and 
I also have a lot of memories of going to nature for solace and spending time with trees, up trees, beside trees. I was a reader, still I'm a reader actually, but as a kid, take my book out to the trees and read out there. So I have those memories as well. Um, and then later, after I really started studying herbs, my dad told me that my mom was actually an ethnobotanist, which I hadn't like known. She died when I was quite young. And I knew she was an archeologist and she worked very closely with the Kusharam band in central Utah. But when she died, she was actually working with the elders of the band to catalog their herbal medicines. Wow. So I thought that was interesting. I just didn't know that because, uh, you know, she died when I was so young. So she was interested in kind of like It's kind of like in the blood, you know, it yeah. wasn't my intention to follow that track, but it, it worked out like that anyway. That's I such would a cool say thing I was to interested in like, yeah, yeah, it really was. Yeah. And then after that, I was very interested in alternative health, like as a kid, like as a teenager. I remember when I got my driver's license, I was super excited to drive myself to Fred Meyer because they had the health se section. And they had the health books. And so I would go there and like look at the health books there and just like wander up and down the aisles. And my dad raised me super independent. And so he would give me money for food. And I bought my own food starting when, from when I could drive myself. So he'd give me like a weekly allowance for food. And I was just in charge of taking care of my own food. Mm -hmm. so I would go to Fred Meyer and I would get like my Amy's burritos and yeah. um, buy like organic food and you know look at the herb book so I was always interested in, in that way and then you know life went this way and that way I got really interested in foreign languages I lived abroad and after I graduated from college I met someone who was really into Tom Brown and living outside and so I got like sidelined into that and we ended up going to a school called Earthwalk Northwest in Issaquah, Washington. Yeah. And my um, and then I met my first herb mentor, Karen Sherwood. And we went, I was like in all sorts of classes, like learning how to breed hats, learning how to make a bow, learning how to trap, um, all sorts of things. So it really was Karen, you know, the plants, the basketry, food is medicine, healing herbs. That was what really pulled me in. So I studied with Karen for three years in kind of an apprenticeship capacity. And I love that it was so like, you know, everything we learned with Karen was in the field, yeah. hands-on, you know, it was very much like we might learn something, like we might learn some botanical terms, like in a classroom setting, but then we went out and we saw, you know, we learned what a quorum is, then we went out and like dug up quorums and saw what they were. So I loved that kind of hands-on. And it was when I was studying with Karen that I got really sick, like a very mysterious illness that took me out. Like I didn't get out of bed for over a month and I had severe arthritic pain and this weird fever that would come at night and then go in the morning. I thought it was like a cold or a, well, not a cold, but I like thought it was some kind of flu because I had a fever. Yeah. I only knew of fevers like with a respiratory infection. So for a long time, I just thought, oh, I have this flu, but then it, you know, after a month and I couldn't get out of bed and I had friends, you know, we thought it was infectious. So I had friends like dropping off food at my apartment door and just like soups I could warm up. And, but after a month I just got dehydrated and kept passing out. So I ended up going to the hospital and took them a long time. They took like, they tested me for everything because I was in like wilderness school, right? And they're right. like, you know, they're like, have you eaten anything unusual? I was like, well, we had raccoon last week. <laughs> and I was like, Here's another 10 set of lists we're going to, you know, tests we're going to do. So they did right. all sorts of tests, but turned out I had an autoimmune disease. So it was very rare, which took them a while to figure it out. And, but they were not like super helpful. <laughs> like they, I mean, in the, I guess retrospectively, maybe it was the best thing that they could have done, but they just said, you know, it's very rare. There's no cure. Um, most people live till they're around 40, um, but you can expect a dec declining quality of life until then. And what we can do right now is put you on mega doses of steroids. You'll feel good for a while, but then they won't work. And that was, and they gave me a brochure. <laughs> and they told me there was a there was a Yahoo group that I could like go to the Yahoo group and, and ask questions there with you know other people who had Stills disease is what it's called. But that was it. I mean, they were just kind of like, see ya. Like that was that was all that they had to offer. You're diagnosed. Seattle, You're done. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was just kind of this is you know this is it. And I lived in Seattle at the time. I did not have any money. Seattle was full of like you know free clinics at Bastyr and. And everything. So I just like, you know, did everything I could. Like I saw acupuncturists, I saw herbalists and naturopaths. And the thing that just totally amazed me at the time is that like I was feeling pretty down, right? Like I'm, get, I'm given a terminal diagnosis, told, yeah. you know, that I've, I've already lived half my life. And so that was, you know, I, so I kind of went in like just being like, oh, I have this like terminal diagnosis. And they didn't, no one cared. Like none of the practitioners I saw cared what the diagnosis was. They were like, who are you? 
what's up for you? What is your life like? And like a label at first of it, a diagnosis. kind of threw me, you know? I'm like, well, who cares what my life's like? I have Stills disease, mm -hmm. but they helped like shift my mindset away from that. And after six months of doing, I you know totally revamped my diet. I think I was super deficient in vitamin D. I've been living in the Pacific Northwest for years. And like back then you, we didn't talk about vitamin D the way we do now, you know? Right. So, so I think there was just all these things that came, you know, came into place. And after six months, I didn't have any symptoms and that just rocked my world. And after that, I was like, I knew I wanted to be a clinical herbalist and help people who were told similar things like that, you know, there's no hope. So I was just, it really opened my eyes. I mean, Western medicine does amazing things. I'm really into integrative health. Um, right. I see a Western medicine um, nurse practitioner, so not opposed to it, but to be, you know, when you have a chronic illness and you're just given the label and given the pill without any other support, that's really lacking. And I, I wanted to, to help people in that same situation. I love that story, just all of it from the get-go. Like it was, I just got to know a big flash of Rosalie, which is really great, but it's so true. Like I also love Western medicine and if it weren't for it, I wouldn't be alive today, but there is so much that we can do with plants and with food and, and with herbs, which are plants and food. And I'm so grateful that you went through such a challenging process or you wouldn't be able to make so much of an impact on so many other people and their lives and encourage so many more people to turn to herbs and to get that nature connection because I'm much like you in the nature connection factor. I, I My background's in environmental and experiential ed and I used to spend a lot of time as a wilderness therapist and learning to live off of the land and that's where my desire to learn about plant medicine was formed. So it's cool to hear that story from you and make that connection. But I also want to backtrack to when you were 10. What's the Mormon tea herb? <laughs> Oh, it's a, it's a type of ephedra and it's a really cool looking plant. Um, you know, it's ephedra no looking what. and it's like these like little branches. It's not a plant that I know really well because it doesn't grow anywhere around me. I have since visited it and been like, hello, thanks for calling me in so yeah. many years ago. But it's really been, you know, like one time I've seen it since, you know, like, well, since I've become an herbalist. So it's very common in, you know, Southern Utah, Colorado, New Mexico. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. And that explains the like astringen astringency and that, that bitter taste where you might be like a 10 year old going, this is gross, but it's neat. <laughs> so. But it's so cool. Yeah. 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 And I wish I knew it's um, scientific name, you know, it's, it has its colonized name, which is like Mormon tea. Sometimes it's called Brigham Young tea, mm -hmm. you know, definitely influenced by Mormon pioneers uh, having it. But yeah, I can't remember its, it's scientific name off the top of my head. That, that's really cool though still and it sounds like the three-year apprenticeship was a great kickoff with with Karen for the rest of your herbal career and your herbal ways like you I love what an impact you have made you've made an impact on me and thank you for that and I know you're making an impact on thousands upon thousands of people and it's really beautiful to see and I'm really grateful that you're doing it. I guess that's part of the thank you part, but um, I'd love to hear where you went from working with Karen and getting to really be in the field and be connected in those ways, because there is so much power with getting to meet the plants and getting to experience them and be with them and listen to them. And, and then there becomes so much more when it comes to becoming a clinical herbalist. It's a, it's a, Mm -hmm. much different form of study right. so right. how did you go that direction yeah well I, I do want to say that my time with Karen those three years it was like I was waking up I mean it was just a super transformative time for me every like every day felt so magical and enriching and that was you know such a wonderful way to be introduced to herbalism because like that magic was like immediately interwoven for me yeah. and when I first started I didn't know any plants like I, on my first day of class, Karen kept talking about plantain. I lived in the Dominican Republic. So I thought she was talking about like, you know, the plantains that you eat. Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> so incredulous. I was like, really plantain? Weird. You know, and she's like, oh yeah, it grows everywhere. Um, and she's like, I'll, I'll take you out there right now. And she like took me out to her driveway and showed me plantain. I was like, oh, different plant. And that was where I started. I didn't know anything. And through my years with Karen, I began to form relationships with every plant that surrounded us. So I really, that was the time I went from the wall of green to being, you know, really excited to meet each and every individual plant and to get to know them really well. And Karen was always hands-on. So we were, it wasn't just 
saying hi, but really interacting with the plants on multiple levels. So, so yeah, that was definitely a, a wonderful time. And then I, Karen wouldn't call herself an herbalist. I don't think she's really an ethnobotanist. And, and I, so I, after three years, I changed, I moved and I wanted, like, I knew I wanted that, like you said, that clinical because I'd had the health problems myself. And I wanted to know, you know, what does it take to like work one-on-one -on -one with somebody and really like help bring them through that process. Yeah. And so I started studying with Paul Bergner long distance and I went to the East West School of Herbology and also my clinical mentor was Carter Predicts in Kalsa. And that was a, like in some ways a radical shift from what I had learned before because yeah. it's especially Paul Bergner is really into nature connection as well, but I was learning long distance. So it wasn't quite the same East West School of Herbology and KP. It really is a clinical you know, you're really working with diagnosis, you're looking at memorizing herbs, dosages, like it's just more of a like linear thing. Science. I mean, it's just, yeah, yeah. yeah. Less so, magic, more science. Yeah, and I loved it. Yeah, I loved it so much. I remember like sitting, I'd go eight hours of, with KP in one day, and I swear that lasted five minutes. I just felt, he was like a fire hose of information, and I would just sit there and be like, whoa. And um, <laughs> so I loved every second of it. And I loved being a clinical herbalist. I loved working with people one-on-one. -on -one and but ultimately I, I actually stopped being a clinical herbalist slowly. I took some time off to do my write my first book, Alchemy of Herbs. And then I knew that there was just something lacking in my personal clinical practice. And it really was that nature connection. Like because I had learned clinical work from a very clinical perspective, I was having a tough time like struggling to bring that in. Yeah. Um and so that I kind of meandered away from clinical herbalism and, and began teaching more and more where it was just, I don't know, more intuitive and natural for me to bring in the nature connection. Yeah. I, I, I feel like I relate to you in so many different ways. Like Paul's also one of my great teachers and I did the Matthew Woods old school, Portland school of traditional Western herbalism. So I had a lot of really intensive clinical training also and at NUNM and, and yet what brought me into herbalism is the connection with nature and the wonder. For me, I was like, I, I started with Scott Close as one of my mentors in the field and connecting with plants and, and whatnot. Well, I started before then with books and online programs, but that's where I really got that, that deep connection. And I love clinical herbalism and I'm so grateful that it's a lifelong study and Having that knowledge is what makes you a really, really good herbalist to be able, to, I think that's one of the pieces that makes you a really, really good herbalist to be able to formulate and to pick the plants that actually worked. And I think that for me, when I went through the experience at Elderberry School of Botanical Medicine out of Portland, which was very hands-on, very in the field and getting to know the plants, it was lovely, but I was missing that like, but why do these plants work? Why is this helping? A person, you know, and and that's where I dove into the clinical part. But um, I also feel you so much on the need for that nature connection and how that it's such a part of the healing. And and how do you how do you incorporate that? You know, like I'm I'm interested to hear your transition. Like you briefly spoke about it to stop to write your book. Like yeah, how did that go for you? I guess mm -hmm. is the question. <laughs> Well, I didn't make it back to clinical herbalism in terms of like one-on-one -on -one consults, which I could have. It was just like my interests and path led another way. And you still could I later. I say like, <laughs> what was that? I said, and you still could later if you're just like, I still okay. could later. Absolutely. Yeah. Sometimes it does call to me. Absolutely. I, I often say, um, I wonder who I'm going to be as an herbalist when I grow up, just because I have done, like I've gone to farmer's market and made the products and I've, you know, done the one-on-one -on -one consults and I've done um, plant walks, you know, I've done like all these different things. And it's just, that's a wonderful thing about herbalism is it just keeps growing as we grow along with it. So yeah, yeah. it's beautiful. It takes you on your own path, you know, that's, that's yeah. what I love about it. Like, what's it going to be? And to reflect back on that journey and that path for you, starting on an actual path on a guided hike when you're 10 with your dad, you know, and, and yeah. now you get to take other people on that journey. I think it's, I think yeah, it's beautiful. That is really like my passion is I like that those, you know, I think of that like feelings I had with those three years with Karen of waking up and that's really what 
that's where my passion lies right now is helping people have that same experience of immersing themselves in the world around them while also empowering themselves with, with medicines and knowing how to make herbal remedies. Both both of those together are just kind of the, the sweet spot for me now. That's so And cool. that actually began the one like, it was just, you know, whatever life takes you into a different direction is I met Tori Amos, who is my, like, she's been my favorite musician since I was 12 years old. Mm -hmm. And and I'm like pretty obsessive person, so I'm like <laughs> one of the most obsessive Tori Amos fans. And so of course I acknowledged her in my first book because she's the soundtrack of my life. I went to see her in concert and met her in 2017 in Cork, Ireland. I gave her a copy of Alchemy of Herbs. She is amazing. I mean, obviously I'm biased, but she right. is, has this like incredible gift of presence. Mm -hmm. And like when you're with her, you just feel like you're the only two people in the world. And nice. And I was so surprised that she asked me questions, you know, like I gave her the book and just told her how much she meant to me and who knows what else I said, but um, so it went by <laughs> a blur. But she asked me, she said, you know, what is the best way to take herbs? And I'm sure she meant like capsules, tinctures, teas, like that's probably where her mind was going. But of course, in my obsessive way, I kept thinking about that conversation over and over again. And that was how Wild Remedies, that my second book was born. Nice. Uh, days later, I made it back home and I was, I was in the, my kitchen and I was just thinking about it and it just like hit me, like, you got to write that book. Like, not the is it teas, tinctures or, cap, you know, capsules, but the nature connection uh, book, which is, I think what I said to Tori too, is, you know, it's the more we can immerse in our lives, the better. And so that, that was the idea for Wild Remedies. And then two seconds after I had the idea for the book, it was that I would write it with Emily Hahn, my co-author, who's absolutely amazing. And um, so I called up Emily and I excitedly told her, you know, my idea. And she was, oh, that sounds amazing. And I was like, I know. And I <laughs> want you to write it with me. <laughs> so that was how that was born. But it, that, brought, you know, was just kind of born out of having those conversations with Emily so much that it just seemed like the natural thing to do. I love that. That That's awesome. That's really beautiful. I also am a big Tori Amos fan. Maybe not quite on the oh. obsessive level, but I was really fortunate that I got to work in the music industry for a long time. So I got to oh, meet, wow. I didn't meet Tori, but I got to meet some other great musicians. But I remember I was living in Atlanta, Georgia in the 90s. And my big brother took me to the Fox Theater to go see Tori Amos. And I just remember seeing her up on that stage with that beautiful piano, just absolutely making the most amazing like erotic love to her piano and creating this amazing music on stage and I was just blown away by far like of the thousands upon thousands of musical shows I've seen it, it's high up on the list so yeah I definitely listened to her a lot in the 90s also so I love that you got to meet her in Ireland of all places so do you have an Irish background at all um not really except in the way like European mutt style so also a European mutt so <laughs> your husband's French right did you yeah yeah I have you... actually done the DNA thing and I do have relatives in Ireland uh but yeah it's not like uh my grandparents immigrated from Ireland at all so. right I would imagine I do too just because my dad's like super redhead guy I'm kind of in my older age getting dark hair but uh, yeah I would imagine that redhead trait it's gotta it's gotta be in me somewhere but definitely a mutt I haven't done the DNA thing so um, that's awesome so you've got a wide array of knowledge of so many amazing plants you brought up one of my absolute favorites already which is plantain like it's one of the ones that I think everybody needs to know um, I'd love to know what herb you think if you could choose one, what herb should everybody know? It's oh, a hard question. No, is it allowed for an herbalist to ask an herbalist that? <laughs> I mean, I've been doing it for a couple of years now, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. and it's the hardest question for everybody on the interview. So I, I think yeah, that's why I, I feel love like that. we could have a conversation each day, and I could make the case for a different herb. Yep. <laughs> right now, I'm really, really smitten with lemon balm. Mm. <laughs> my team, yeah, yeah, Melissa, I, I could choose lemon balm for that. I one because it's so friendly towards folks, like it tastes good, you know. So and it's so plentiful. Like they say, if you want to prove yourself as a gardener, just plant lemon balm. I would say in a container, <laughs> but <laughs> you might overprove yourself a bit. <laughs> but it's yeah, wonderfully abundant and tastes so lovely, and it has so many gifts that are. I don't know, just feel like unfolding, like, you know, has this wonderful nervous system 
calming activity that I think we could all use <laughs> at some point in our lives. It seems, especially in these past couple of years, having that that guide with us to kind of help train our nervous system, just calm calm down. Or especially out. now, like during this season in the Pacific Northwest when it's so dark. So dark, yeah, yeah. And it's it also is just so aromatically wonderful and it's wonderful for digestion. So I drink it almost every night as an after dinner tea. I often combine it with other things, but lemon brown is often the, the main player there. And so for me, it's a constant companion and very comforting because it does taste so lovely. That... I included lemon balm in my first book. And when I did the research on there, one study that like blew my mind out of all the studies that, you know, I looked at hundreds and hundreds of studies for that book. And the one that like really sticks out is a study that they did with radiology staff. And what they did is they, it was like 50 radiology staff. They took their blood as a, you know, before they did, began the study. And then they had them drink lemon balm tea for a month. And then they drew blood again. And what they saw was that the post lemon balm tea month, they showed significantly less DNA damage and less oxidative stress. So these are folks, you know, who are being exposed to minimal amounts, but still, you know, x-rays is a big part of their job, radiology right. stuff. So I thought that was just like, whoa, that was so cool. And the thing about it too, like they were just using like tea bags. It was just like very little amounts of right. <laughs> lemon balm and stuff. I was just like, wow. Yeah. It wasn't even like, how can you recommend people try lemon balm, but it still had these wonderful results. And I just, it was one of those things like everybody should know about this. Like people who fly regularly, people who work in dental offices, anybody, you know, like anybody who might be getting an x-ray, like why not just have lemon balm as a, as a companion for that. So I, that was one thing that blew my mind about it, but it's, there's just, you know, it's gifts go on and on and on and yeah. it's wonderful infused into oil and protects the skin. Uh, yeah. There's so many lovely things. So I think it's just so approachable. It's so abundant. And there's just so many gifts that you can pick and choose. There is some like some concerns about it in regards to how it interacts with thyroid, but that is like a super up in the air, big question because the research that kind of founded that was just horrible and not really what you would base that on. And so now it gets repeated a lot, but we actually have no clinical evidence that lemon balm is harmful to the thyroid, even if someone has hypothyroidism. <laughs> but I always say if like someone's nervous, don't you have hypothyroidism and you're nervous about working with lemon balm, choose another plant, you know, there's no <laughs> there's like, more. <laughs> Yeah, but there's, I like to just mention that because I think that there's a lot more fear around lemon balm and hypothyroidism that is necessary. Right. And it will be interesting to see that. But I've talked to many clinical herbalists who have not seen that as an impact. And so I'm, I'm not afraid of it. And I encourage yeah. other people to yeah. explore their relationship with lemon balm. Right. Yeah. And if you feel that it isn't working for you, again, like you said, choose another herb, you know, mm -hmm. um, I, I love that. I wonder if it's probably in your book and I'm just not looking at it, but um, if you were to choose, you mentioned tea, but if you were to choose another way for people to use lemon balm in their lives, that was easy and obviously it's affordable because it grows in such abundance. How would you have them make lemon balm more present in their lives? Mm -hmm. Well, definitely. I know you said, I already said tea, but I would like to reemphasize the tea. And one so thing that's yummy. <laughs> really fun with lemon balm is that you can choose different amounts and different steeping times for totally different experiences. So there's really no one way to make lemon balm tea. And I would really encourage folks to try less, try more of the actual herbal content, try steeping it for less, try steeping it for more. It's not that one is better than the other, but they're going to have different effects. So yeah. that is something that's like endless tryings of lemon balm tea to really find out there, there are different effects So you can like, tonight is like a really strong lemon balm night or, oh, I just want a little bit or, you know, so you can like get that sense of like what, what works for you in any given moment or day. Yeah. I also really love it as an oil infusion, as I mentioned, and that can be something you can just have it infuse it into something nice and light that you could use as like a facial oil. I got a ton of sun when I was a kid. So I kind of now one of my self-care practices is lots of protective herbal infused oils on my face and my chest um, before I go to bed almost every single night. Makes a wonderful breast massage, belly massage. Um, so it's so, and it just like has that wonderful smell that's brightening and cheery. So I, I really like it as an oil. Of course, then the essential oil is famous for herpes um, and being, being used against herpes virus. But you can also, you know, make a like lemon balm infused um, 
lip balm. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, lots of fun ways to play with it once you have it as a infused oil. Yeah, I love that you chose lemon balm. I don't think I've had a guest choose lemon balm. I want to mm -hmm. share a quick story of lemon balm for me. Like, obviously, I love her. I use her in many of my tea blends and, and use her on a, a regular basis. But uh, my name's Melissa, but I was named after the Almond Brothers song, Sweet Melissa. But as mm -hmm. I got older, like, I, I became Mel since I was like eight years old, right? And then as I got older and somehow I had this herbal products company have my name in it. And I felt really insecure about it because I thought people would think I was an arrogant jerk. And I didn't want to be an arrogant jerk. Just somebody named me this and that's how it ended up being. And so I, I felt really odd about it. And then at some point in my journey, becoming an herbalist, I'm like, well, maybe I should call myself Melissa. So they don't make the connection that, that my <laughs> name is Mount Mal and like, you know, I love lemon balm and so it makes perfect sense and so I tried that for a short amount of time and I guess my email signature still says Melissa but nobody calls me Melissa but <laughs> I still when I think of lemon balm I'm like ah oh, you know I love the Almond Brothers song but I love that uh, that's my namesake as well so silly little story but I had to share it. <laughs> yeah. um, I love the idea of just the the lemon balm on the belly too and um, I love obviously oils on my face all the time. I'm like, hey, I, I look better than some 43 year olds. Not all of them, but some of them. And I'm gonna call that to the plants and, and the good oils, which is really, really great. I would love to hear a little bit, you know, you're an author yourself and your books are fantastic. I, I really do love them. They're just beautifully laid out and displayed and the information is concise and approachable and really, really easy for people to absorb, which I think is a gift, especially when, um, when you do have such deep knowledge in the realm of clinical herbalism. Uh, because that can get so complex and yet you have to be able to transfer that information to common people so that you can make more of an impact and and I love how you do it and I wonder if you just want to share some about like your process or how writing a book was for you mm -hmm. yeah Great question. I feel like there's so many ways to respond with that. <laughs> I will say writing my first book was terrifying. I yeah. was absolutely terrified. <laughs> I didn't seek out the book deal. It just kind of landed in my lap and I had not thought of myself as a writer, author, anything like that, but it felt like this amazing opportunity. So I just, you know, dived into it, but the whole process was terrifying. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> that was kind of my memory of that. Um, and then towards the end, I remember just like, I had a big energy switch where it just became really fun. So I'm glad it like changed, but yeah, it was like beginning parts were very terrifying. So I don't know if anybody needs to hear that, but it's okay to keep writing even if you're terrified. Yeah. I need to hear that. Like I keep being told you should write a book, you should write a book. And I have like 5,000 ideas of it. And I know that I will one day, um, one day when I stop doing too much. So <laughs> <laughs> which is coming. I'm promising that for myself for 2022 to not do too much and to really stick to the things that I love. So that's mm -hmm. part of why I asked, like, how was that process for you? And I imagine it's terrifying. I have quite a few friends who have written books or are in the process and run into continuous blocks. One of them is a mutual friend of ours out of Portland that I talked about when you asked me where I was. Um, yeah, so I know that this kind of information needs to get out to the masses and um, yeah, just curious how it worked for you. Yeah, yeah, so that definitely, and then then alchemy was so well received that that really was like a confidence booster for me. Cause the thing was, I just, just had the like negative voice in my whole time. Like, is this good? Does anyone want this? You know, just kind Imposter of thing. Imposter syndrome. Like, I did. I was very much imposter syndrome. And then it was so like received beyond my expectations. Um, and that really helped. <laughs> so, yeah. um, which sounds kind of maybe like superficial or very ego. Like I needed the, the boost from other people, but it, it did truly help. And wild remedies, especially co-authoring it with Emily, we, we call it ourselves Remily, um, because we think <laughs> so really, we have di very different backgrounds. We bring different gifts to the process. Um, like she's super detail oriented and is a wonderful editor. Um, and I am not those things at all, <laughs> but we just, 
like the, the whole writing process flowed so well nice. that it was just kind of like, we still, you know, we still collaborate and we're still amazed at how well things flow be between us. So that was a wild remedies was kind of in some ways more fun to write in that it, I had a partner and, and it was a topic. So, you know, that's so near and dear to my heart and it felt very important to get that, get that book out. Yeah, that's awesome. And I want you to know that I don't think that it sounds like a very ego driven thing to need that because you're, you're putting yourself out there and that's scary for anybody. And, and as I, I mentioned in the beginning, I've watched you from afar for almost 10 years now and, and I've watched you grow and grow. I can see it as an individual and and obviously as your impact has grown as well and it's and it's beautiful and i think i i've just got to thank you for sharing that you needed that validation as well because i think that we all do it imposter syndrome is a thing and if you don't have it you're probably some type of arrogant jerk and you should have it <laughs> you know so i just wanted to share that with you um so as far as books then go, yours are amazing, but if uh, what other books on herbalism have really, really touched you in life and that you think that the people listening to this show should check out, that it's like one of those books you must have? Hmm. Well, probably my most impactful book I've ever read in my life is Robin Wall Kimmerer's Braiding Sweetgrass which I think a lot of folks have read by now. But if somebody hasn't, that is number one thing to do after getting off this podcast is to go <laughs> get that book in some way, shape or form yeah. and then read it 10 times, uh, which is about probably how much I've read it. It's also Robin reads the um, the audio version and it's very wonderful to hear the yeah. words spoken in, in her voice. So get the audio, get the book. <laughs> um, that is, and it's not strictly about herbalism necessarily, but it's certainly that um, plant human relationship on so many different forms. So yeah, that is yeah. my easily my favorite book of all time. It's a great one. Um, another book kind of in the same vein and that it's not strictly herbal, but it is about connection is The Enchanted Life by Sharon Blackie. Another book that's made a huge impact in my life. Uh, she wrote another book called If Women Rose Rooted that is often the favorite, I think, but The Enchanted Life is really my favorite. And it really is about uh, reconnecting to the land around us. And um, yeah, another one that's wonderful to read like yearly as a reminder. Yeah, absolutely. So I love that so much of your mission is to help inspire more people have that nature connection. Uh, also one of my missions in the world and to inspire people to take better care of nature through taking better care of themselves. Um, I'd love to just talk about some of the most important pieces to having more people connected to nature because uh, mm. it needs to happen, you know, and, and at the same time, well, I'll get into that later. I'd love to just talk about the, the importance of, of that nature connection for mm. people. And, and why it's such a, a huge part of your mission. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I remember being on a walk with Cascade Anderson Geller. Oh, I, I saw you did a tribute to her this year. Have you heard um, that yet? I haven't. I just saw that today, actually. Right. And I, it's on the list for sure, because um, I did not get to study with her a lot. Um, but I did have some... Um, we stayed in the same house once at a conference and I got a lot of, you know, just one-on-one -on -one time with her and then taking her plant walks and, you know, and conferences and stuff. And she, in a short time, made a huge impact in my life, as I think she did for many. Yes. Um, and for someone maybe who doesn't know Cascade, uh, Pacific Northwest herbalist who's been an herbalist for many, many decades and, um, and towards the end of her life, which ended quite suddenly for many of us, um, she, I, I, that's when I was getting to know her and in a lot of her plant walks, she talked about how she, as she was becoming an elder and, and her life was changing, that she felt really inspired to talk less about herbal facts and more about deep herbal wisdom. And one of the things that she shared was about this idea that we should stay on the trail and we should never make an impact in so-called nature and how important it is for us to erase that line between humans and nature. 
And obviously that can like bring up a lot of fear because we have examples of humans doing really bad things in nature. Um, so there's that, or, you know, do, doing bad things to land, being extractive, exploitive. So there is that. But the point that Cascade was making was in that moment was that we will dearly protect and defend that which we love and have a relationship with. And if our relationship to the world around us is on this two foot wide narrow path and it's just like, don't touch, you know, look, don't touch, stay on this path. Don't, you know, basically don't interact with the world around you. Then it's going to be a, uh, a difficult thing to foster that deep connection so that we do defend and um, protect that which we love. So that is one like a major rallying call for me. I, I was a very hardcore activist in college. Like I often say, I minored in activism <laughs> and I worked on a lot of indigenous rights um, campaigns, things you know involving fossil fuels. And I was also very um, upset about sweatshops and uh, I like I was like the person who was on the street corner in Portland. I went to Lewis and Clark and I was on the street corner in Portland, like passing out flyers, stand in front of the Gap store and like pass out flyers about how horrible the sweatshops were um, for Gap as people were like going in. I was like clueless, right? Because like not one person was like, oh, really? Oh, well, never mind. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, that was like, I, and I was just very like, very passionate and very much wanted to make an impact through activism. It got burnt out pretty quickly because it was just not effective. Like what I was doing, I obviously still value activism, but what I was doing in that time was like not serving me and I was not really seeing a huge impact um, through that. And that was when I like, it was shortly after that, that I went to um, study with Karen and understood this like deep connection then fosters that um, ability to, you know, make sacrifices to protect um, the world around us. So that is a big rallying cry for me. I don't know if that even answered your question, Mel, but that's what came it up. <laughs> brought so many feels up for me, like one, the Cascade talk and her never ending lessons. And, and I look forward to you listening to the episode about it. I won't get into my Cascade stories or I'll start crying or whatever. Um, but it also brought up so many feels for me just because I'm with you. Like my, my entire mission behind everything I do is to protect the planet. Like, sure, I want to help people, but even more than that, it's, it's this beautiful, precious earth that we have that is, is not loved. And, um, I mean, it's, it's loved, right? People love it, obviously, but it's, it's being significantly abused by we as humans. And one of the things I've tried to figure out for so long is like, how do we, and one of my taglines at my herbal products thing is inspiring people to take better care of the planet by taking better care of themselves. And how do we shout that from the mountaintops and the treetops, how important that message is and how can we use our gifts and our skills to, to share all of that kind of stuff. And the whole reason I got into herbalism is because I was a backpacking guide and a wilderness therapist and I loved connecting people to nature. I wanted everybody to be connected to nature, right? And I, I studied environmental and experiential ed in the early 2000s and one of my teachers was like, oh Mel, that's, that's great that you want to get all these kids outdoors, but what are you going to do when all of your favorite places are now paved over campgrounds or um, you know, you head to the trailhead and it's completely packed and you can't find that solitude or you go to the trailhead and there's trash everywhere. And I hate to say it, but that's today. <laughs> and this was the early 2000s. And it just makes me even more inspired. Like, how can I do more? How can I shout this from the mountaintops and treetops? And how can I say my how, how can I use my accidental herbal products brand <laughs> to make more of that impact? And, you know, as you know, I'm now in REI, which is a, the ideal place to have that kind of message with plant medicine in there. Not that there's medicine in any of my products because plants can't heal you, <laughs> that they're there. And it's getting to people that love to get out, out outdoors and create that connection. Like, is that part of it? You know, is that... I don't know. I'm I'm really excited about what you had to say and your mission, and I'm 
I'm on the same mission with you. And it's it's really beautiful to see that kind of thing. My my latest hashtag spread like wildflowers. Hmm. Because nice. it has to, you know? <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Well, one yeah. thing that comes up with you're mentioning all of that of, you know, full trailheads and trash and um all of that is that uh, that is like a big shift of being turning from kind of an exploitive, what can nature or plants offer me mm -hmm. versus creating a cultural mind shift of recognizing interdependence and recognizing reciprocity. Mm -hmm. And I think that is the shift that also needs to like run parallel with our connection there because it is opening our eyes to interdependence and community of being in relationship with the world around us and what does that mean what responsibilities does it entail um you know what types of caregiving can we participate in uh so it, it does take like not just a i have the right to be here right you know kind of thing but also just this greater understanding of what does that mean to be um to be in reciprocity with the world around me and and shift from an exploitive mindset i mean I grew up in an exploitive mindset, you know, that same, was absolutely, same. you know, it's not like, it, I don't think it's something we need to shame. It's something we need to recognize like, okay, we, um, certain people culturally might have a propensity towards an extractive or exploitive relationship. What does it take to, um, foster more feelings of reciprocity? Yeah. What does it take to shift that? And in ways, again, that aren't shaming, but as can be a beautiful, wondrous, enriching experience that, people crave because it is so fun and wondrous and uh, an amazing experience. So it's not like, it's not shooting. It's right. not Don't shoot shaming. On the people. <laughs> yeah. It's really this joyfulness of it, which is like dandelion is a great example of that. Like it, it literally just blows my mind that we spend billions of dollars, like as us homeowners, billions of dollars on killing this one plant, which <laughs> is not only just like, you know, giving all this money to horrible corporations that are, um, creating these poisons, um, but it's also harming pollinators, harming our own watersheds. Um, I, in my rooted medicine circle class, I, I hear students all the time talking about how their neighbors are spraying stuff that then wanders into their lawn, which is like, or into their yard, which just breaks my heart. You know, you don't even want it, but your neighbor sprays it and, oh, anyway. So <laughs> one thing that I'm a big proponent of is dandelion pesto and um, you know, dandelion coffee or, you know, co root coffee, um, and sharing how wonderful dandelion is with people who might be on more of the spraying into things, um, to just engender that, that love of dandelion and how wonderful it is. Um, yeah. so I guess it could be it. some innocent <laughs> naiveness on my part, but I'm just like, if everybody saw how wonderful dandelion pesto is, or could just really look at the flowers for the first time and realize that they are truly beautiful. There's no reason to kill these things. Right? Um, How can you not want this bright, vibrant yellowness in your yard? You know, like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that that's so much of it like how do we how do we inspire more people to see that and and it is a challenge you know um just because our society has turned to like you must have this perfect lawn and you must have this perfect image but i think obviously maybe it's easy for me to see that mindset shift because it's my life um but hopefully that shift is happening a bit more on a grander scale and all we can do is keep doing the good work to continue to inspire that shift that connection mm -hmm. yeah 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 i do hope there's a time when the next generation is like do you remember when our elders sprayed her yeah. herbicides on, <laughs> on plants wasn't that weird yeah, Why absolutely. <laughs> I really hope my daughter's a part of that. And, I, and I've got a, quite a, a strong feeling she'll become an activist in her own ways. She's already one, almost to a bad point. <laughs> like she's She wants to save everything and turn it to a, into a dress for her dolls or a, like every mm -hmm. paper bag becomes a new skirt. And I'm like, babe, like we can recycle those things. But mom, that's wasteful and it's not good for the planet. <laughs> Like, perfect. I love that. I yeah. love that. Like, I do recycling. too. I love it until it becomes so much clutter that I'm like, I, I need to 
eliminate some clutter, my child, <laughs> make some of it, come on. Um, but yes, it's beautiful to see. And I hope that more of her generation is like that. Obviously, you know, she's got a mom that has certainly led her in that direction. And I just hope that there's more and more and more of those parents raising their children in that way, because this poor, poor planet says we need it. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and this has been really fun connecting with you because I'm getting to hear so much more of, of you and your story and not um, not just about the plants, you know? And, mm -hmm. and I love the plants, you know? They're obviously a very important part of the story, but um, the mission and the importance of it is really just absolutely beautiful. Yes. So. Yeah, it's been really fun to chat with you. So I'm really, really grateful you have me on. Yeah, I'm grateful too. I'm, I was like, I was nervous and had imposter syndrome about asking you on, <laughs> which is so <laughs> funny. You know, one of my other dear friends, Orna, um, one of the first people on my podcast, uh, we were chatting, like, as I was starting to do a podcast, I did a whole bunch of like, who am I to, to run a podcast about herbalism? I don't know anything, you know, meanwhile, I've been studying herbalism since the early 2000s and um you know I've, I've just got so many brilliant teachers and mentors that I've learned from and I think that's one of the the beautiful pieces about herbalism and as Paul Bergner says you know like you'll be you got like another another 95 years before you're an expert and and you know it all in that realm so um I think that's what I love about it too is like I was a kid who would get bored easily in school. I needed a continuous challenge all of the time and I'll never be bored with the study of herbs and plant medicine. And the, it brings together the most beautiful of people and you hear the most amazing and impactful transformations and stories on how you can help people and, and make a difference for our planet. So it's beautiful. How else can people learn from you and hear from you, Rosalie? Well, I have a website, herbswithrosalie.com, and I have lots of monographs, uh, herbal articles on that site and recipes. And just this year, I started a YouTube channel and podcast, Yay. so learning how to do all of that. <laughs> What a joy that and is. <laughs> yeah, and joy it is. Um, big learning curve. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I feel you. <laughs> and if um, people are interested in studying with me directly. My Rooted Medicine Circle course is a 10 month online course. It's about bridging the gap between nature connection and making herbal medicines. So that is the live course. Um, so we do all the live, live trainings um, online and that enrolls in January. Nice. Uh, just once because then we stay together for, for 10 months making all sorts of remedies from teas to tinctures and glycerites and oils. And, incense so we do it all <laughs> that's awesome that sounds like a really really fun course and i love that you're doing it live um there's so much importance in that live connection i think as a teacher because you get to connect with your students and you're not just talking into mm -hmm. a screen today um <laughs> and then obviously it's so much more important for the students as well and we're lucky that we have the ability to do it over zoom you know but there's so yeah. much more impact also when you can like i i love learning in person face to face um mm -hmm. but in these times we're very fortunate to have this kind of thing i know mm -hmm. for years i had insisted that i just hate computers and i want nothing to do with them all i want to do is be with the plants and walk outside and hug a tree and talk to people and then i had this i have this wonderful bookkeeper who was like mel that's great but why not use technology for what it can do for you and the larger impact that you can make with your mission? And I was like, oh, right. <laughs> but the learning curve is, is a long one for somebody that would much mm -hmm. rather sit outside under a tree and, and, and watch the river flow by. So, mm -hmm. um, so rooted medicine sounds amazing. That's coming out in January. Is that the beginning of January that you're going to launch that or, or? Um, and it'll be the last half of January. Okay, cool. Maybe we'll have this episode out. And so more people can tune in and hopefully, um, join you there. That sounds really fun. Yeah. And then I know you are on Instagram and you didn't say your podcast name yet. I'd love to just get oh. those things in. <laughs> Absolutely. Herbs with Rosalie podcast.com is where you find that or the herbs with Rosalie podcast. 
Nice. Same as the YouTube channel. Cool. Yeah. I think it's the same. It might be my name, Rosalie de la Forêt, on Instagram. Lovely. Yeah. Awesome. Yay. Your Instagram presence is wonderful too. And I'm really grateful I got to connect with you. Thank you yeah, so much likewise. for coming this is, on. It's a fun conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. It's been great. I would, I'd, I'd love to connect with you live and in real person and go <laughs> connect with some plants together. That would be really fun. Yeah. I'm sure it'll happen. It's not that we're. It kind of it's interesting because I know Orna, I know you know. Well, we have the, a lot of interconnected lot of friends. friends. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, how have I not run into her in person yet? Because you don't ever go to the Brighton Bush Herbal Conference, and um, I have before. Really? Maybe I just didn't mm-hmm. talk to you there or something. But that's the that's the conference that made me walk away. Like, oh, I know what I want to be when I grow up. <laughs> So, oh, still working yeah, on that's that part. Cascade. So. But me too. You'll if you listen to that episode, um, you'll hear that story. So it's, it's a pretty impactful one for me, and it's what what keeps me going on this mission as well. So mm-hmm. it's I will definitely listen. It's pretty powerful. And I just actually I just heard from um, oh my gosh, my brain is not working right now for her husband's name, but I absolutely love him. And he just reached out on Instagram and was like, thank you so much for this. So we connected again later after Cascade had passed and I didn't realize I was talking. Elliot, thank you. Sorry, (laughs) I had to like rethink that. I didn't realize I was talking to Cascade's husband and we were just like talking Cascade stories and I shared mine with him and he shared his with with me like when he first met her they were at a halloween party and she had this really sexy witch's dress on and his cauldron and i had no clue who he he was and i'm like okay (laughs) and then later realized who he was and got to really have Mm -hmm. some great times connecting and some fun music and playing and singing and dancing and all the great things so yes she's she's her impact lives on long and strong that's for sure anyways rosalie absolute pleasure and honor to get to connect with you and i hope that the rest of your day is magnificent oh thank you very much it's been a real pleasure to be here mel yeah take care see you next time